Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Chapter 4 of Transformative Nursing in the NICU, Trauma-Informed Age-Appropriate Care. My name is Mary Coughlin. I'm a neonatal nurse practitioner by training, and I am the founder and president of Caring Essentials Collaborative and the author of the second edition whoops, of Transformative Nursing in the NICU. Um, so as we've been taking you through the book um, and we approach chapter four, chapter four is titled the science chapter and it's within the section called the science and soul of trauma informed care. Um, I call out three specific scientific foundations, maybe pathways that I think are relevant for um, the application and adoption of a trauma-informed paradigm. But to be perfectly honest, there are many others. Um, I, in the first edition, I introduced a polyvagal theory as a very important scientific um, process and, and theoretical construct that helps us really understand the implications of trauma on the mental and physical health of these developing individuals and, and all of us, you know, if, if you started out as a baby, it's probably applicable. <laughs> um, and I've been kind of hemming and harm before I logged on to see how do I want to proceed with this chapter? Because of course, you know, people are always publishing newer, cooler stuff, you know, more um, expansive, more comprehensive, more detail. So I think what I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to approach each subcontent, um, subtopic rather, um, separately. So within the science chapter, um, after I give a little intro, I talk about the neuroendocrine immune network, which I'm going to talk about today. And then tomorrow, we're going to talk about epigenetics and early life adversity, and then follow up on Monday with the energy costs of traumatic stress in the NICU. And that's when we dive into mitochondrial stuff, which is really cool and interesting. Um, it, and I hope that feels okay to you guys. Um, please share your feedback. Is this relevant? Is this helpful? Are these too long? Are they too short? You know, what would you like? Do you want PowerPoint slides? You know, just, you know, please let's, you know, co-create some, you know, learning experiences that are really valuable for you, that are really helping you embrace this material. So, um, as I have mentioned in the previous chapters, I like to open up the chapter and often close the chapter with a quote. The chapter, that, uh, the quote that opens up this chapter is from the brilliant and only, one and only Albert Einstein. And here's the quote. Anyone who thinks science is trying to make human life easier or more pleasant, it is utterly mistaken. Um, and I, I, I have to smile when I read that quote, you know, um, because, I think we don't know what we don't know. And the more we dig into the science, the more we discover and we discover that there's more that we don't know and we deep, you know, dive in and dig deeper. And it's wonderful and it's fun and it's exciting and it's exhilarating. Um, but I think we also just as this section um, speaks to is balance that science with the soul dimensions, with the existential dimensions, the spiritual dimensions and that sort of thing. And so, and we know that that's what, um, Albert Einstein did, right? He balanced both the science and the soul of his work. So I'm going to, you know, just get really into the nitty gritty of the science um, for right now. And then maybe what we'll do at the end of this chapter, you know, maybe on Tuesday, we'll just kind of summarize and integrate. Ooh, yeah, let's do that. We'll summarize and integrate the information that I've shared with you um, because it's, it's ever unfolding. And so the way I open up this chapter is really to just kind of, again, continue to position the relevance of a trauma-informed paradigm. And, and I believe very, very steadfastly that understanding the biological processes associated with early life adversity is a first step in changing the paradigm. And I want to bring your attention to this really great paper. It was... Um, published in 2019 by Agarostos et al. And it was, uh, and it basically developed this, um, he and his team developed this kind of a conceptual model. And I'm just flipping over here so I can get to the, his paper. Um, I, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and actually share with you the graphic if I can make this big enough for you guys because he just did such a brilliant job. And you can see in the, in the graphic that there is so much more to, um, the science than what I'm presenting kind of in a condensed way in the um, in this chapter. So let me just scroll to the image and then we'll do the, sh the share, the screen share. Oh yeah, here it is. You're gonna love this. 
Okay. And I think I might have mentioned this before, but if not, um, it's all good. I'm mentioning it now, right? Um, all right. So here we go. And I put that Adobe Share. All right. So um, here's the paper. It's in neurobi It's called um, Neurobiological Trajectories of Early Life Stress. And he put together this really cool graphic conceptual model on the developmental trajectories of early life stress. Um, in a schematic model of moderating factors and allostatic um, processes involved in early life stress and um, childhood trauma. That's what ELS, early life stress, CT, childhood trauma. And so, you know, from a, a NICU perspective, a neonatal um, clinician perspective, you can see here at the top, um, and I present this in the book, um, hit one, right? So, you know, how we come into this world, like literally, um, sets the stage for how the rest of our bio biology is going to cascade um, afterwards and how we will either be vulnerable or resilient to different experiences and events in our lives. So we have that genetic epigenetic susceptibility. And I'll be talking about the epigenetics tomorrow, but just, you know, put that out there, right? So there, and, you know, there is, there are many um, epigenetic and genetic predispositions to disease. Um, so that's kind of laying in the wings, if you will. And then there's the fetal um, programming, the prenatal stresses, what's the maternal um, health and wellness, what's uh, from a a physical perspective, but also from a psychological perspective. We know that um, mothers that endure um, toxic stress, domestic violence, um, have history, uh, history of collective trauma, intergenerational trauma, poverty, all of those things have now kind of wired her biology and that this new developing human is evolving in that setting, right? In that milieu. So that's also you know, kind of setting the stage for this individual's ability to adapt, respond, um, you know, adapt to, I think I've ever said that, um, to whatever comes their way. Um, then you get that first, that next hit. It's not the first hit, because they say that that first top line is the first hit, the early life stress. And so for me, that orange bar, that's the NICU, right? And so the impact of the experiences at that, at that initial level, um, are contingent on a lot of different variables, right? The timing, the developmental stage, where are you on that um, gestational continuum, right? The more immature you are, the more vulnerable and susceptible you are to these traumatic exposures, these traumatic experiences. The intensity, the frequency, the duration of the experience. Um, these other two categories, you know, role and the type of um, early life stress, um, I don't think that they're necessarily um, implicated when I'm talking about the NICU, but they could be, you know? So it's important for us to understand this. And there's lots of really great papers and, and these guys talk about it as well, um, about that idea of critical and sensitive periods or windows for development, right? That things are supposed to happen this way during this time period. And if those things don't happen, those neural networks, they just dissipate and go away right? Um, those experience expectant neural networks. So it's important for us to understand that, you know, a healthy human newborn is not anticipating, is not wired to expect pain. They're wired to expect loving kindness, cuddles, kisses, and all that kind of, you know, social relational um, experiences. And so pain, separation, sleep fragmentation, all of those things are unexpected. And so what happens is the brain has to adapt. And so it's important for us to understand that. And, and I think a lot of that, this just kind of came to me. So, you know, when the spirit moves you, you gotta share. You know, I think one of the, the challenges that we have societally and certainly in the NICU is fully recognizing the personhood status of these individuals, right? Really being sensitive to their needs and the pervasiveness of, and the, and the stratification of the different levels in, of, of our um, acknowledgement, right? Of the personhood of these young individuals um, changes our, our engagement with them, changes the rapport that we create with them. And that can also become an additional stressor. So it's the, the compounding of these stressors also that can really escalate the trauma experience of the individual. And then in this blue box, 
um, this is where it gets really stimulating and, and cool and exciting, looking at all of the allostatic processes that happen, that, that are impacted by this um, early life stress, this toxic stress or this trauma. Um, allostasis is just a fancy word for stress, right? You've got homeostasis, which is stability and equilibrium, and then allostasis is responsive to a stress. And before I get too far ahead of myself, you know, I'm also not saying that all stress is bad because stress is an important part of human development. You know, um, I was stressed anticipating doing this series with you guys, but um, that stress that I felt just kind of compelled me to really critically evaluate, do I really wanna do this? Is it, is it the right thing to do? And then I adapted to that stress by you know, deciding I'm gonna do the book, that feels like a safe place to start and stuff like that. So stress is an important um, piece of our development. What, what I'm talking about here and what other researchers and authors are talking about is um, the toxic stress. Um, and so this is in, the, in light of toxic stress, that neuroendocrine stress, um, you know, uh, responsiveness is activated. Um, and then in the immune system, and we're gonna talk about this, right? The neuroendocrine immune uh, network, when you have a stress response, it's not just cortisol that gets squirted out, it's a whole bunch of other inflammatory mediators. That's the immune system. So neuroendocrine immune. And so the brain development, that neuro piece, um, also there's implications that happen at that level as well. And um, I just recently shared an article um, on my uh, 12 days of articles in review that talks about um, how that stress really um, creates these, well, exacerbates these watershed areas in the brain um, because of, you know, redirecting of blood flow and that sort of thing in response to a stress response, right? Um, that different parts of the brain are more vulnerable to these alterations in perfusion. So under, again, understanding the magnitude of this, um, it just, it just goes so deep. Um, the epigenetic programming and the transcriptome gene expression. And I'm gonna dive again more deeply into that tomorrow. I just came across a really interesting article that's now looking at DNA methylation um, associated with necrotizing enterocolitis, right? So they're finding these methylated um, transcriptors or uh, tr uh, transcription genes. Um, and these individuals go on, you know, are, going to have neck, necrotizing enterocolitis. So we're learning more and more about how all of this experience is playing out physiologically, emotionally, psychologically in these vulnerable human beings. Sleep and circadian rhythm is disrupted as a consequence of stress. Um, you know, when you have, not that all, all stress is not pain, uh, have the, yeah, but all pain is stress. And that experience of stress slash pain actually can disrupt your sleep. Think about yourself, right? When you're freaking out about, I don't know, short being short staffed or paying the bills or uh, studying for the exam, right? You don't really sleep very well. Um, that's again, you know, when it's a chronic experience of stress, it disrupts your sleep. We also know um, from many, many studies about how these allostatic processes um, perturb metabolic integrity and uh, metabolic, metabolic um, homeostasis. So that's also um, factored into this, these allostatic processes. And then redox states, right? So um, oxygen-free radicals, telomerase activity, which is really interesting. We're seeing now in these um, premature people and survivors of the NICU that they have shortened telomeres. That's a, um, in a response to this telomerase activity, which is activated in the setting of chronic stress that these telomeres actually become senescent, um, you know, kind of deteriorate prematurely, premature aging, if you will, of the telomeres. And the telomeres are the caps on the ends of your chromosomes that are super densely packed with DNA material that's supposed to last you through your life but you start using that stuff up like mad, at the beginning of your life, these telomeres become senescent. Um, endothelial dysfunction, and that could be um, connected with some of these um, GI um, perturbations that we see in the premature individuals, because again, the, uh, you know, your upper, your airway, not your upper area, your airway and your um, GI tract are mere invaginations of the surface of your skin. So all of that endothelial tissue is exposed to this stress as well. And then, you know, and so that's like that initial 
boom, you know, uh, traumatic stress experience. And then you recover from that, recover from that, right? You adapt to that, um, but it's not like that's the end of it. Okay, you're all done. No more stress in your life because who was expecting, you know, the, the stress and the trauma and the toxic stress associated with the COVID-19 global pandemic, right? There's lifelong things that come along and hit you up the broadside. Um, and, and your reaction to that is on this foundation of the stress that you've already endured and survived. So I, I like how they do this. And they actually go into great detail over every single um, element in here. So you've got to get that paper. I mean, and, and I do kind of give an, a high level overview of it in the, in the book, but it's absolutely a brilliant paper. And for me, I think it's a must read if you're taking care of um, people during their early life experiences. It's really important that you um, connect with that, that science. Um, so to just kind of let you know, my first introduction to this idea of neuroendocrine immune network was again from that original American Academy of Pediatrics paper that I that I came across when, once I left that um, psych nurse um, position that I had many years ago back in uh, 2013. And the AAP had published a paper in 2012 that was looking at the lifelong implications of toxic stress and the role of the pediatric professional. And, um, and they had curated a lot of science um, at that time. And there was emerging information about this neuroendocrine immune network. So obviously automatically I had to dive in and really get a handle on what the heck is that talking, what, what the heck does that mean? Um, how does that play out in the biology and the, and the developmental trajectory of these individuals? And so, um, I want to share with you um, another image that I think you're going to find really fascinating that for me um, helped me get my head around it. I'm just um, scrolling uh, the Miller and Nestlec paper to give you that graphic representation so you can really kind of see. Oops, I obviously went too far. I'm so sorry. You're being so gracious and patient with me. Don't hang up. Oh, oh it's, of course, it's at the end of the paper. What was I thinking? Oh, and now I rolled my mouse too quickly. Okay, so coming back to you guys, let's come over here. We're gonna do the screen share again, and we're gonna do um, Adobe. Okay, so this is, um, this was a graphic representation that, again, I'm a visual learner, so I just found this just insanely helpful. This depiction of a neuroimmune network and early life adversity. And um, so, so I'm just going to, you know, read um, here what I've, I've opened up this section on. Efforts to better understand the mechanisms underlying the link between early life adversity and adult morbidity recognizes that this relationship is nonlinear. It's complex, it's interconnected across several biologic systems. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, research suggests that this early life adversity amplifies bi-directional communication between peripheral inflammation and neural circuitry responsible for threat and reward system. And um, so these guys, Neslick and Miller, this paper was published in 2016. There's another one from 2018 that, um, Maybe I'll see if I can find for you really quickly. Um, that again, just think, again, this is a conceptual model, a theoretical framework for us to really understand how these experiences get under our skin and how they um, are linked to adult morbidity. And that much of the morbidity we see is, is um, mediated by this chronic low-grade inflammation. Now, um, before I came across these guys, I had been reading a fair bit of work by um, Bruce McEwen. Bruce McEwen is a super genius guy, uh, physiologist, and, um, and probably other cool things too, who was uniquely interested in the effect of stress on um, adult patients in the intensive care unit. And um, he came up with these really cool models that helped us understand how that stress really um, delayed wound healing, um, you know, delayed discharge really had a negative effect on these individuals physiologically and psychoemotionally. And um, this concept then was picked up by this um, brilliant nurse researcher, Tiffany Moore, who um, 
it, it, her paper that I that first triggered this like whoa what the heck is this all about this is amazing um, where she looked at she was trying to understand reflex was reflex am I doing this or feeding intolerance maybe it's feeding intolerance Tiffany Moore if you're watching this please forgive me um, I'm, I'm hoping folks will get the gestalt of what it is that um, I took away from your paper um, that. She, she started out with this like really cool model of adapting Bruce McEwen's work to the neonatal patient population and looking at the more common um, morbidities, right? Associated with being premature, specifically necrotizing enterocolitis, interventricular hemorrhage, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. I think she had an ROP in there too. They all have a component of inflammation um, to their pathogenesis. And so what the, um, what she was trying to say is when we expose these individuals to a protracted experience of toxic stress, are we compounding the pathogenetic development, right, of these diseases? You know, the, the, the severity of the illness, is it confounded by the experience of stress? Um, as we, you know, and she based that off of, you know, a deeper and deeper understanding of this interconnected biology with um, our neurology, our immunology, and our um, metabolic our endocrine system. So it just really, really fascinating. And I found that um, understanding this is really, really helpful for us as NICU clinicians, because we can then see, okay, these situations are stressful, they're activating a toxic stress response. I understand what happens when that cascade is initiated, that all of these things get played into motion and it sets up this chronic um, inflammatory process, this chronic state of stress that is a precursor to the adult morbidity and, and of course, short-term morbidity too, right? It's not just like, oh, you're fine until you turn into a grown up and then you're messed up. No, it's, it's ongoing evolutionary um, disruptions of the developmental trajectory of this individual. And so understanding this, at least from my perspective, just makes sense um, that if I understand that that's what's happening, and I think you're gonna find the same thing when you start to see what happens epigenetically to these individuals in the setting of toxic stress, you're thinking, well, holy moly, if the first admonition for a healthcare professional is to first do no harm, and I understand this biological cascade, and I'm not doing anything about it, I am doing, I am causing harm. And so that's why I think it's just so important, you know, for us to understand this piece. I mean, understanding the biology isn't the reason why you do the right thing, to do the kind thing, do the compassionate thing, but it certainly does help you understand the magnitude of the benefits of doing those right things for these incredibly vulnerable individuals born into this highly technological and terrifying environment that's obviously life-saving. If we're going to serve these people to, the high, to our highest capacity and, and support them thriving and even flourishing in their life, it's critical that we understand the biological substrates and the biology of toxic stress and understanding the neuroendocrine immune network is one piece of that puzzle that I think is really important for us to understand. So I hope you found that really interesting. I will um, include those two article citations in the description um, below in the YouTube video. And um, they were both open access, so cool. And, um, and I invite you to continue to explore, ask me questions. Um, this is really important that you understand this if you're going to become part of this movement as we transform the heart and soul of healthcare um, around the globe by adopting a trauma-informed framework. So thank you so very much for your time and attention, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Take care and care well. Bye.